Hello, and welcome back to the Security Metrics Podcast. I'm Jen Stone, one of the principal security analysts here at Security Metrics. The topic today is uh, something I'm very excited about. It's about how legal aspects apply to privacy and security. A lot of times I, I talk with organizations that the biggest kind of stress and fear is around the legal parts of things like HIPAA, GDPR, or there's confusion about it. How do you even read these laws? How do you apply them? Um, so I have found a really awesome person to come and talk to me today. Her name is Victoria Beckman. Let me tell you a little bit about her. Victoria is the leader for the Americas of the Digital Crimes Unit, or DCU, at Microsoft. DCU is responsible for implementing strategies to disrupt cybercrime by dismantling criminal infrastructure through civil actions, collaborate with organizations and governments to strengthen cybersecurity and support victim remediation, design education campaigns, and advance policies and legislation to deter and decrease cybercrime. Victoria is a certified privacy manager, CIPM, and certified information privacy professional, CIPP US by the International Association of Privacy Professionals, or IAPP. Prior to practicing law, Victoria was an industrial engineer in the technology and automotive sectors and a comp competitive figure skater for her native country of Colombia. Victoria is very cool. I'm so excited to have her on the show. Thank you so much for joining me, Victoria. I'm very excited to have you, have you talk to me. And I would love to hear uh, a little bit about your educational background, your career background. How did you get to here from where you started? Well, thanks, Jen, for being for inviting me. I'm very excited to be here as well. And um, my career has been kind of wild. <laughs> it hasn't been conventional at all. Uh, I was. I'm going to give you a, a quick summary. Great. I was born and raised in Colombia, uh, only child. And uh, I graduated very young from high school. So at 16, I found myself having to figure out what what to do with my life. Uh, it's different in Colombia because it is unlike the United States that you can change your major and you can kind of figure out as you go. In Colombia, if you apply for, a, let's say, industrial engineering, like in my case, you applied and there's a curriculum and you have to follow and take the classes that they tell you and you can't really change oh. midway. So it was actually a bed with one of my cousins. Uh, he was attending this university in Colombia that is uh, very prestigious and has a, a very uh, well-known uh, engineering fac engineering campus. Sorry, I'm forgetting the words. No and, worries. Um, <laughs> and and he, it is fairly difficult to get accepted there. You have to take a test, and it, the results are published in the national newspaper first oh, wow. page and everything. So it was kind of a bet. Oh, uh, you know, you can't really go here. Oh, so it was a was really difficult there. big <laughs> and deal, said, and so you made a fine. bet with him. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So I met a bet. He, uh, we grew up fairly close together. We're close in age. And he was kind of the doogie houser of the family. <laughs> he was the, the genius of the family. So I said, um, and also there weren't a lot of women because it was only engineering. And I said, well, I, I can do that. So I actually did. Mm -hmm. And I passed. <laughs> wow. And then I, I was kind of stuck in there. Uh, my parents were very excited that I was going to go to that university and be an engineer. So I said, OK, well, let's do this. And, um, <laughs> and I, I liked it. But but when I graduated, I started working as an engineer. I used to work for a, a subsidiary of General Motors. And it was fairly uh, a tough environment from the work, like the daily life perspective in that I was young. I was a woman. There were mostly men, um, people who have been there for years who said, well, we're not going to do what you tell us to do. We have been doing this for 40 years mm -hmm. and this is how we're going to do things. So it, it was tough. It was very tough um, working, working in that environment. At some point, they said, we have a program in the United States where you go, you learn the processes and then come back and apply them here. And I said, okay, to be honest, I did not want to come to the United States. <laughs> uh, at that point, my cousin, that one cousin, have gone to be a professor at the University of Barcelona. Mm. And I wanted to go and um, be there with him and study there. 
whatever. <laughs> so, uh-huh. um, but they said, well, it's only six months and you learn. And, and I said, okay, cool. This will be, I can do this. Originally, they sent me to Arizona where they had um, proving grounds. But I happened to land in Arizona the morning of September 11, 2001. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> and uh, I did not speak any English at the time. So when, so I actually realized what was going on because I called my parents to tell them I made it, I'm here, and my mom is crying, saying, you need to come back. They don't want any foreigners in the U.S. Mm. This just happened, blah, blah, blah. So... Fast forward to my experience at, at, at this subsidiary of GM, there were other engineers from Mexico, from Brazil, and, and it was tough at the time because of what had just happened. Mm-hmm. They didn't really know what to do with our visas, how to feel, sure. blah, blah, blah. Um, and I had this genius idea, and I decided I'm just going to quit, and I'm going to get another job. I'm not going to tell my parents because they're going to make me go back to Colombia and I did that, and it was not pretty. <laughs> but, did not but you speak didn't English. speak English. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I could. Uh, it was a total disaster. But at that point, I felt I couldn't tell my parents that that was going like that. So while I keep telling them that everything was great, I work any job that I could find. Mm-hmm. So I work at a hotel. I work at a supermarket. I work all kinds of <laughs> crazy places and and realized that if I wanted to stay, I needed to change my visa. Mm -hmm. So the fastest way was to get a student visa. I thought I'm going to do some kind of master's in engineering. And again, out of kind of uh, not really a bed, but this was more somebody saying, you should take the LSAT. You have a lot of reading comprehension and you will know what is to take a a test in English. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay. And that's how the idea of the LSAT uh, came up. No one in my family is an attorney. I never thought about being an attorney. I don't, I don't think I even knew what attorneys did at that time. But I took the LSAT. Out of a miracle, I did fairly well. I applied to Arizona State because that's where I lived and I didn't know anything else. And the dean of the law school contacted me and said, we want you to come here. Uh, what is it going to take? And I said, money. I don't have any. <laughs> And so they ended up giving me a scholarship if, as long as I kept certain GPA. Nice. And, and in my heart, I wanted to be a public defender. That's what I did in law school. I was an intern and, and I was dead said that that was going to be my career. But a mentor said, you know, you should go to a big firm and have that in your resume and then you could be whatever you want. Mm-hmm. And I let him convince me. So I went to a, a big firm and I worked two years doing intellectual property litigation because of my background. And I hated every single day. Oh, of it. No. Uh, I was like, this is not for me. <laughs> uh, so two years into that, I quit and I went to be a public defender. <laughs> so wow. I, I actually joined the um the heaviest the corpus unit, which is the unit that defends people on death row. Mm-hmm. And I loved it. Loved it. Uh, that was going to be my life. Mm-hmm. Uh, met the person who is now my husband, <laughs> and he did not like that job because oh, I no. was constantly in prisons and, and witnessing executions and things like that. Yeah. And, and he, was, he also happened to be from Ohio. So <laughs> he said, we're moving to Ohio. And I said, well, you realize I'm going to have to start all over again. Uh-huh. And, and so when we moved to Ohio about eight and a half years ago, um, I was very, I, I actually was scared to go back to a law firm. I thought, uh, this is not, I got a job at a law firm and lucky enough, the first week that I was there, a case involving a hacker that had transferred money to China mm-hmm. came in. They were already, um, they had done already all the forensics and there were all the forensic reports and everything. And they said, you're an engineer, you you understand this, you figure it out. <laughs> so I read and I yeah, did not fair. understand. No. <laughs> I was like, I have no idea what this is. Uh, but I loved it. And I thought, if I'm going to be working at a firm, at least this is something that has kind of the technical aspect that I that I did like about engineering. And, and I can do, I can do this. So 
I started just on my own reading and going to conferences and I started just kind of absorbing er anything that had to do with that. And, and then the kind of rumor, <laughs> then, you know, another case similar that came, they gave it to me. And, and next thing I know, that became my practice. Uh, so that's, that's a long story to tell. That, is a, that is a wild story. <laughs> Re remaking yourself uh, regularly and and being extremely successful at it. I I love that story. And isn't cybersecurity fun? It is. It is a lot of fun. And that was actually one of the things that that made me feel like I I like this. Um, it, it is always at least well from all standpoints, but from the legal standpoint, is also always changing. It's fairly new. Mm -hmm. uh, so I felt like there was a, a little bit more of an even feel. There wasn't going to be the case where an attorney that has been doing this for 40 years says kind of, well, young lady, I know how to do this. I've been doing it for 20 years. It's kind of like, no, we, we all have the same <laughs> and here's the thing: and chances. <laughs> it's, it's okay if you have experience to tell someone else that does not have as much experience, hey, uh, let's rely, on, maybe let me share your experience. But when you use the words young ladies, just pro tip for everyone out there, that's probably not the best phrase to bring into it. Um, so tell me about your, your current role. What what oh. do, what do you do and and what do you like best about what tell me tell me about those details? So I I love it. Um, I think it's a lot of fun. I think it's the perfect job. But uh, so now I'm at Microsoft. I lead the digital crimes unit for the Americas, which means from Canada to to Argentina. Um, and what we do is my team has attorneys, has analysts, has technical people. Uh, because what we do is we try to keep the internet safe and, and everything safe for our Microsoft products, obviously. But we do a lot of pre, uh, pre crime work. So when you hear, you know, in the news about a, a breach or something like that, it's probably too late for our team. It's probably in the hands of another team. And so we have, uh, several what we call labs where we have analysts and, and computer people that are constantly monitoring uh, behavior online. And we kind of go after uh, criminal networks. So let's say, for example, we, we do ransomware, we do, well, any, any kind of malware, we do technical support fraud, business email compromise, all, all these different kind of targets that we have. And let's say, we find uh, suspicious activity in Mexico, for example. And, and so we start kind of following that. Then the investigator creates a report and then presents it to us. And then as, um, as attorneys, what we do is we work very closely with law enforcement in each country to say, uh, here, here's all the evidence. This is what we have. We need you to help us by prosecuting this person because we obviously don't have that capacity. Or sometimes we actually file civil claims. And another arm of my job is in order to file those civil claims, we have to be fairly creative because there is not legislation that covers a lot of these crimes. So we have to be creative in that we, depending on the country and the laws that they have, we have to come at uh, the cases, uh, let's say, oh, is this, can we kind of say, claim that this is a fraud or impersonation or invasion of privacy? But mm -hmm. we want those laws to evolve. So we, I also work very closely with legislatures to say, we know you want to come up with laws for this. And they probably don't know much about it. So here is a suggestion of, of good, the same best practices for cybersecurity hygiene or how you will um, create a, a, some kind of safe harbor law so that that companies can follow an industry recognized standard and then get some kind of legal uh, reward for that. And uh, it could be, let's say, and some states have done that in the United States, that you get an affirmative defense to a tort claim if you can demonstrate that you follow a standard. So we, we come up, I'm constantly in communication with law enforcement, with legislature, with Congress from, you know, Panama, Mexico, whatever, to say, this is where we want to go. Um, 
but ultimately, again, our goal is to work as a team to try to stop these cyber crimes from happening. That's that's fascinating, um, especially uh, the involvement with legislation. I had always wondered, you know, who comes up with because lawmakers don't have expertise in that, and, and so so how do they get that language for um, solving some of the privacy and security? issues that they're trying to legislate for. So very interesting that Microsoft is part of that and, and you bring your background to that. Yeah, and we're, we're obviously not the only ones, but they do because of the relationships we have with them. Uh, they, let's say there is an initiative in Peru for a, a cybersecurity law. So they send it to our team and we send back comments and other companies and other people send back comments and, and you know, and they ultimately adopt whatever they want to adopt. Right. <laughs> so let's refocus a little bit. There is a relationship between privacy and security that is not often well understood. Some of the people that I work with, they, are, they fall under HIPAA regulations, which, which, you know, is a privacy law that that uses security. I would like to hear your perspective on the relationship between privacy and security and, and then some of the legislation that, that enforces privacy and security. Sure. So uh, there are two different things. They, they act together most of the time, but they're different. Cybersecurity relates more to, um, I guess, illegal access to the information. So how do we keep the information safe so that a hacker or somebody who is not authorized part of our company doesn't have access to this information and disclose it when it cannot be disclosed. Uh, and obviously there will be technical, administrative and physical safeguards to keep that information safe. Privacy is more with who um, is authorized to access that information. So I guess it could be quote unquote more legal access to the information. In privacy, for example, we have a, let's say we have a company, uh, but not everybody can have access to the payroll of the company. Mm -hmm. So we need to keep that private and only the HR person and the CEO, for example. And so we, we, from the technical aspect of it, we go and set up the controls so that only those people who should have access to it have access to it. Um, so that's why kind of, it kind of interact. Also, a lot of the privacy laws that are that are being proposed or enacted have the component of cybersecurity in that they they request or have the requirement that the information has to be uh, safe and has to be kept safe. Or some of them have um, actually including a, a private right of actions in case of a breach and and private information gets disclosed. Mm -hmm. um, and some of them also have um, requirements to notify of a breach if 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 a breach happens, uh, where someone has access to personal identifiable information that shouldn't have had access to. So that's kind of how they interact. Not all privacy laws have that. You mentioned HIPAA. HIPAA has a, a very defined privacy rule and cybersecurity. Um, and some, let's say, California Consumer Privacy Act has a private right of action only out of a breach when information, certain type of information, actually not all of it, is disclosed. Um, some of them don't mention anything about breaches. Right. <laughs> so, uh, so it just kind of depends on the state, depends on the industry, uh, depends on a lot of things. <laughs> right. So... Uh, it feels like we're getting a lot more privacy legislation and security legislation than there has been in the past, which, of course, because cybersecurity is evolving um, uh, and criminal activity online is evolving. And so it makes sense that we try to wrestle with these these questions of what should be legisla legislated. Um, from your perspective, what kind of trends do you see among uh, for legislating uh, these things. Um, well, as you mentioned, I think I think there is more awareness from even consumers and legislatures and, and everybody in general about the risk and about the consequences of, of attacks and about the consequences of not keeping information private. So I think in the from the privacy side, uh, there was uh, there's been kind of an explosion. 
after 2018 when the uh, GDPR, which is, uh, I forgot, general protection. Oh, my goodness. General data protection regulation <laughs> um, in, in the European Union became effective on May 18, I believe, 2018, uh, because then other places were kind of like, oh, wait a second, we need to figure this, especially because the GDPR, even though it's a European Union law, has this, what they call this extraterritorial component, meaning if you are a company in the United States, and you process information of a European Union subject, not citizen, has nothing to do with citizenship, somebody located in the European mm -hmm. Union, you have to comply. So at that point, a lot of multinational companies were forced to review their privacy policies and said, okay, we need to comply with this uh, if we're gonna be operating in, in both continents. That inspired California, and California inspired Colorado and Virginia that have been enacted and become effective in 2023, and a wave of privacy-like uh, regulations that are either inspired on GDPR, or CCPA, or a combination of those. Then, from the uh, cybersecurity side, well, we've seen all the all the breaches, all the hacks, and and I think. People like us, common people, are seeing the effects in, in regular life, in our day-to-day -day life. Sure. So I think it used to be people thought of like the hacker with the hoodie somewhere and stealing someone's money that wasn't yours. But then when you can have gas because there was a hack, then you're like, wait a second, maybe right. this is important. Uh, or... You know, you have all your information from social media, like disclosed because there was a hack or something like that. Then I think people are more aware. Right. Uh, the, the, the one difference that, that we that I also see in legislation and in general and the approach is that traditionally Europe has been very concentrated in, in privacy. And this has a long history from World War Two and, and things like that. Um and so in the, in the European Union and in Latin American countries, privacy is actually a fundamental right. And most of those countries have privacy as a constitutional right in their constitution. Mm -hmm. In the United States, the word privacy is not even mentioned in no. the constitution. <laughs> and that's not necessarily the approach. The approach has been a little bit more uh, from the economic standpoint mm -hmm. in let's get all the data that we can of people so we can target them with advertisements, we can personalize this and that. Uh, so I feel like the the laws that are being proposed reflect a little bit of that. Uh, they're more, and there's even a difference within the states. There are some that are clearly more protectionist of the individual, like mm -hmm. California, because they have celebrities and, and there's been cases even of stalkers getting celebrity information. Uh, and there are other states that are more wanting to have companies invest in those states. Yeah. So they're like, mm, this, you know, this is costly and difficult for companies, so we're not going to go there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a lot of organizations end up in a position of being subject to some of these laws, these regulations, and, and their technical teams, their IT and security teams get told, okay, uh, we have to uh, abide by... The, the California uh, privacy law. We have to uh, abide by GDPR or by HIPAA. HIPAA is a, the, a really common one. Um, there's a lot of um, health-related business in, in the U.S. And so w they're often handed this requirement from their business leaders saying, we must be compliant with HIPAA, for example. And then the security team is going, well, we don't, how do we do that? How do we demonstrate that? How do we know? Because um, one of the questions I get asked all the time is, you're going to come and do a third party um, audit against uh, maybe the HIPAA rules or, or help, you know, see where we're at with that. But there is no certificate. You can't be certified HIPAA compliant. You can't be, you know, these, these are laws, not certification standards. And a lot of the people that I talk to are kind of scared of that. They're like, well, they feel like they're putting in a, in a really difficult position. And then they ask, well, how do we demonstrate both to ourselves and to our leadership and to maybe customers 
that we're doing the right thing when we can't get a certification. What kind of recommendation would you give them for that? Well, I, my recommendations are not going to sound like super legal because I feel like number one, get a cool attorney <laughs> that is not going to tell you, no, no, no. That's a, uh, that, you know what, that a is reason. a really, that's a really good uh, recommendation. I don't want to breeze past it. So, so when people don't, if they have a law that they need to follow, you know, c- cover and they don't have an attorney, that's a, I think that they started in the wrong place. <laughs> yeah. So definitely, definitely get advice of counsel. Um, you know, the, there are attorneys and I used to do that, that specialize in, in this. And so there is no point in you kind of trying to go along. At least some kind of guidance is, is necessary because and that was going to go to kind of my second point. Um, it is important to really understand the laws and see whether they apply or not to you. Uh, for example, <laughs> I hear people like, oh, that's HIPAA information. That's HIPAA. Anything that has to do with health is like. Well, actually, the definition of HIPAA and who is a covered entity is so narrow Yes. that if you're not a hospital, you're not a famous provider. In fact, even if you're a, a doctor, but you're not receiving insurance and you're, your patients are paying you cash, you're not necessarily having to comply with HIPAA yes. in some instances. So, so you need to actually understand the law and see if it does apply. CCPA, for example, there is a, a high threshold of uh, the income that you have to have. You have to have more than 25 million in net revenue a year. Uh, so a lot of a lot of the companies don't have to worry about it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, all kinds of. So that that's very very important, and that's why I say get somebody who knows and and who is also going to explain this to you, so it's not scary. Is going to explain. Okay, we have to do X because of this. Um, and, and I always also told my clients in the past, uh, it's obviously a, a kind of um, a risk, a balance of the risk. Number one, if you are, you know, if you are selling things on Etsy, like that you're making a home and you don't have some kind of privacy notice, likelihood is no one is going to come and arrest you because you don't have a <laughs> privacy <laughs> notice. Um, or you are selling stuff here and someone from Europe ordered, you know, three or four of your T-shirts. Okay, you're not, you're likely going to be fine under GDPR. <laughs> um, so look at that and look at the risk and, and do kind of that economic balance. I encourage people to do something. Not, don't let the, the whole thing scare you and be like, ah, oh, we have to be HIPAA compliance, so we can and but something is better than nothing. Mm-hmm. So if you are a small business and you don't have all the resources to invest in this huge cybersecurity program, okay, well, start with the basics. Start with making sure that you have, that you require strong passwords, making sure that you uh, have VPNs so that if your employee goes home and, and shares the computer with their kids and their grandmother, that at least then they, that, you know, they're separated. Um, that they have some basic training that is super easy to do about recognizing phishing emails and not opening links and not, you know. Uh, and I see this like with my own mom. She, you know, before she will, she doesn't live in the United States. Uh, she doesn't even speak English. And she will call me like, oh, I want something. And I'm like, okay, think about it. What are the chances that they're looking for you in Colombia <laughs> to give you some... <laughs> I'm like, no, it's no, not. You or, didn't win anything. Yes. Yeah, so I'm like, no. Well, but, but he said here, you know, my friend told me, I'm like, no, trust yeah. me, you're not missing anything. <laughs> um, so, so I think, I think taking a little bit of that, of that concept of this is so kind of out there and complicated and I'm not an engineer and I'm not, no, you, you can, you can do a lot on your own with basic things. If you even small companies happens, like if you're a small company, well, make sure that you keep, let's say, your employee information separated, that you keep it uh, safe. You could even be put it in something, back it up and, you know, block it in a safe. Uh, so. So start with something. That would be my advice. I love that. Just I really like how you sense. how you started with doing the risk assessment, because so many people when they're when they are st- stressed or fearful about something, um, one of the best ways to 
quantify it and and allay the fears is to add it to a risk assessment, either a, a, a current risk assessment or or start a new risk assessment. You know, so make sure that that it is a formal process where you say this is what we're worried about. This is the likelihood that that's going to happen. This is the impact if it does happen. And then you can look at it kind of rationally and say, all right, based on this, am I going to put some type of remediation in place to, to mitigate that the potential risk there? Or am I going to accept the risk? You know, so, so having a fear in your head about something, like you said, do something because that helps you move forward, but also um, taking a really... A re- rational look at what is the true risk, I think is helpful to, to a lot of people. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more with you, Jen. Like, it, it, it's so important, again, because even if there is a risk, the fact that you're aware of that risk and you sit and made the decision, you know what? I'm willing, I know this risk is out there, but I'm willing to take it because of this. Because let's say that I'm a big company and it's not even that costly. Or I'm a small company and chances are this is not going to happen or whatever it is. Uh, and I always told my clients, do those risk assessments and document those decisions so that later, if something happens, someone doesn't say, well, how come no one thought about this? No, you know what? We did. We did. And we came to this conclusion and now we're paying for the consequences, but we were completely aware that this was a possibility and we play our, you know, our cards this way. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 I think it's imperative to start with a risk assessment to know where you're at. And not only in cybersecurity, but in everything I feel like in life, like, okay, yeah. I'm here. I want to get to point B. Uh, how is that going to happen? Sure. I, I absolutely agree with you. I think there are a lot of lessons that we can learn from how we deal with risk and security and privacy in, in the cybersecurity realm. Tons of that applies to our personal lives as well, things beyond work. Yeah, decisions with your kids, with your, like, <laughs> it's yeah. all a, a constant risk assessment, I yeah. feel like. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so, something that I've noticed um, uh, myself doing is, uh, the better I get at risk assessments, the more, uh, the quicker I am to adapt to a, a difficult situation to future planning. And so this is something that I like seeing in, in organization is something happens and then they put in place uh, remediation for if it will happen again, because what are the chances something negative is going to happen? 100% because it just happened. So uh, a lot of the groups that I'm working with now that are that are going over the, and updating their risk assessments, I'll say to them, okay, what's in there about having to work from home? Because if they <laughs> if they don't have that after the last year we've been through, they just weren't yeah. paying attention and, and they don't understand the value of, of taking lessons learned and putting them into, into future planning through a risk assessment. So... There's a lot of value in that. Well, and it's also kind of part of that risk assessment is a cost-benefit analysis. I hear, and and you've probably seen all kinds of memes about the budget, like for a company before a breach and after the breach. And and I uh, also kind of that mystery, it doesn't have to be costly, but but you should invest something in some cybersecurity, in some sort of plan, because if you get hit, it is going to be, very expensive. It is going to be, you know, even if you have insurance, you have to deal with that. And now insurance coverage is changing according to, you know, so that they don't have to pay one thing or the other. Uh, You're going to have to get an attorney (laughs) and they're not cheap. Um, You're going to have to get sometimes a forensic team. The reputational cost to your brand could be devastating. And so, so it is better to at least invest in something uh, so you're not later saying like, oh, what well, I, I that was that was an often uh, often the case that they will complain. Uh, why is this so expensive? And and I always say, <laughs> remember what I told you? Like, <laughs> you should have spent you know a thousand dollars back then, and not having to spend a hundred thousand right now. Right, right. Uh, <laughs> I I am with you a hundred percent on that. Um, I sure appreciate the time that you spent with me today, that you brought some really valuable insight into into this topic, and I really enjoyed speaking with you. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks for the invitation again, and I hope that the listeners had <laughs> some fun and got some value out of this. I, I'll, I'll bet they did. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank bye. you.
Thanks again for joining us here at the Security Metrics Podcast. If you like what you heard, please subscribe, please comment, please share. We really want to get the word out for these various topics to people who, who they apply to, and you know that better than we do. So take it up, share it with your friends. Thank you. Thanks for watching. To watch more episodes of Security Metrics Podcast, click on the box on the left. If you prefer to listen to this podcast, it's available on all your favorite podcast platforms. See you on the slopes.